Hello class, my name is E.C. Walker and this is House 2's Chapter 12 Semester Project. Our team members are myself, Scarlett De Jesus, and Kyle O'Donnell. The learning topics that we have for you today are to, dis to discuss system development, specifically the definition, the guidelines, and the phases of system development. We're also going to discuss the importance of project management, feasibility assessment, and information gathering techniques. We'll discuss low-level, procedural, and programming languages, as well as application development tools. And then finally, we'll talk about web page development. So the definition of system development is defined as a set of activities used to build an information system. There are typically three different guidelines to system development. The first one being to group act the activities into phases. So this is just making sure that all of your like activities, all of your similar, similar tasks and activities are all grouped together and you don't uh, have them spread out throughout the, the life of the project. The second one would be, would be to involve the users. This is making sure that everybody involved uh, with actually using the system has a voice from the beginning on how it's set up. They'll have good ideas. It's very important. And then the third one is just to define the standards. And this is just making sure that you're setting rules in place to make sure that at the end of the, the project that everything is successful. Um, and that you've got positive results. So you just want to define those standards. So there are typically five phases to system development. The first one being planning, then analysis, then design, implementation, and finally support and security. Now in addition to these, there's also several other ongoing activities such as project management, feasibility assessment, documentation, and data and information gathering. And we'll actually go further into detail on these items later on in the presentation. So the first stage, or the first phase, the planning phase, this is where you would review and prioritize your project requests. Just making sure that um, that um, the, the higher priority items um, have adequate that you have adequate time to be able to uh, to to do those items. This is where you would allocate your resources. So this is make sure that you have enough people to be able to take care of that as well. This is where you would form your project development team. Uh, typically, these are people that are uh, the users, the uh, analysts, and the IT professionals. The next phase is the analysis phase. This is where you would conduct a preliminary investigation. This is typically the system analyst, uh, otherwise known as the system developer, that will do this. Uh, again, we'll talk about this uh, in more depth later on in this presentation. This is where you would perform the detailed analysis activities, such as study the current system, determine the user requirements, and then you would finally recommend a solution. The design phase is the third phase. This is where you would acquire any of the hardware and software if necessary. It may not be necessary because you may actually already have the hardware and or the software that's needed, but if you don't, this is where you would go and purchase those. Some of the, the leading brands, the top ten, are ones that you're familiar with. It's both Dell and HP, uh, the hardware, on the hardware side. On the software side, you've got Adobe and, and Microsoft that are, again, among the top ten leading manufacturers. Microsoft is also a hardware uh, manufacturer, but they uh, do software as well. The next phase is the implementation phase. This is where you would develop the programs and apps if necessary. Again, you may just be using a system that's cookie cutter. You bring it in, you start using it, tweak it a little bit if you need to. But otherwise, this is where you would actually, uh, if you're not doing that, you would develop the programs 
and apps if they are necessary. This is where you would install and test the new system. It's where you would train the users, whoever it is that's going to be using it in the future. And this is where you would convert over to the new system. So this is also known as go live. The moment that you flip the switch and that everybody is is okay with moving forward, even though they know that there may be a few bugs in the system that they'll have to work out later. And then finally, the support and security uh, phase is the final phase. So this is where you would perform any maintenance activities. Again, this is what I was just discussing, uh, what I just mentioned about any of the few uh, bugs that are still left in the system. Um, this is where you would take care of that. This is where you would monitor the system performance uh, and assess the system security. So these are essentially just making sure that the, the, the system is performing as fast as you want. Um, assessing the system security would be making sure that all of your users have the right um, administrative privileges to do their job, see if you need to tweak any of those settings, as well as looking at um, all of your uh, security settings uh, and the likelihood that there will be any kind of a breach or anything like that. Hello class, my name is Scarlett De Jesus, and I'm going to be continuing uh, from the presentation um, and who participates in the system development. So we have in the system development our system analyst, which is kind of like the go-to person that's going to help kind of situation, situate everything. She's what I would describe mostly as the planner. So she's making sure that everything within the organization is getting done timely and that the effects or security is being established well and that goes with security specialists, network administrators and data communication analysts, um, our users, vendors, database administrators, kind of all around everybody. Um, and then the system analyst is going to do a feasibility assessment and the feasibility assessment just kind of measures how suitable the development of the system is going to be to the organization and with this feasibility assessment there are four different tests that you can do or that the system analyst will do. Um, the first one is going to be the operational feasibility and that's just kind of seeing how well it works. Um, does it meet the requirements and is it secure? And if not, then something needs to be adjusted and um, fixed so that it does meet all of those and it works well. Next is going to be our schedule feasibility and that's just is there established deadlines and are they reasonable? And if they're not reasonable, then they're going to go back and look at, okay, um, did we have this at an inconvenient time? Is it not sufficient enough? And if that's the case, then they could proceed to reducing um, to meet just a mandatory standard or they could just um, extend it if that's possible. Our technical feasibility is if it has or contain or can contain the computing resources. So this is going to be our hardware and our software and uh, services that we have. Um, and if they have within the organization um, what they need to complete the task at hand and if not can we get that from the cloud that's available um, and if not then something needs to be adjusted and then lastly is going to be our economic feasibility and that's more of like what you would look at as the cost benefit factor so is this lifetime software or hardware going to exceed um, its cost. So is what they're producing or getting produced from it um, worth it? Next is our data and information gathering techniques and that's split up into six different categories. I'm going to go ahead and start with review documentation. So we have <clears throat> oops. Um, Review documentation is a collection and summarization of information deliverables. Um, this is going to identify clear, consistent, and understandable data. And then finally, it provides information about the organization. So um, when we're looking at this, we're having people communicate 
um, giving memos, kind of seeing what's going on within the system so that we can um, see um, the information that's produced and we're getting kind of that clear, um, we don't have that face-to-face -face, so we're using through um, the internet network or just um, getting that so it's kind of clear across the board and everybody's understanding what's going on within the organization or company. And it's also going to define what the strengths and weaknesses are. So that's something to keep in mind within these documentations. Um, observing oops, is pretty much just um, the analyst, system analyst is observing how a task is performed. Uh, surveys where the system analyst is going to distribute um, throughout the organization and kind of see what's going on, um, if they like what's going on, if something needs to be changed, stuff like that assortment. And it just allows them to attain information. And then we have the interview process, which is going to be the most important, and that's where we're going to get that face-to-face -face feedback. Um, our system analyst is going to clarify and kind of probe during that face-to-face -face feedback to see what exactly is going on within the organization. And then lastly, we have that JAD session. Um, it's where, um, actually it's put up, it's joint application design. And it's where the system analyst is kind of be the, going to be the moderator. And it's going to work with the IT professionals and user users um, together and kind of a lengthy um meeting to help design or develop an application. And lastly is going to be our research. Um, this is going to provide the system with the latest software and um, kind of skipping over the, the statistics, we have our information literacy components and just kind of having all of these combined together. Um, the system analyst needs these to kind of see what's out there and having that digital literacy being able to surf the web and kind of see um, what programs um, and companies are doing um, helps find or helps them in depth in getting the statistics of the website, um, how often it's being used, and such. Um, our application development has a language and tools, um, and our programming language is going to be um, people who develop programs. Um, use a set of instructions, abbreviations, and symbols that enable a software developer to communicate instructions to a commuter, uh, computer and a mobile device. And then the application development tool is just kind of helping um, make it user-friendly so that you can build the program or application. Um, there are two types of languages. Um, that's going to be the low-level language and the high-level language. Uh, the low level language is um, there's two types with or two different types within the low level language but um, it's just a programming language that is machine dependent and that's just being said is um, one that uh, runs only on a particular type of computer or device so our machine language is first generation of program programming, which is just kind of the first one that's made, and this uses a series of binary digits. So this is kind of that on and off switch, kind of getting that uh, resemblance in between. Um, there's not much to it. Then we have our assembly language, which is our second generation, and this is a program that writes instructions using symbolic instruction codes. So it's a little bit more advanced, and um, it does need um, to be... Um, assembled so that it can be understood by the machine language and this just helps um, execute or run the program. And then we have our high-level languages. Um, I'll go ahead and start talking about the procedural and then we'll continue with the last three. <clears throat> so the procedural language we have um, it's a programmer that writes instructions that tells the computer what to accomplish and how to do it. It's more advanced, so it's the third generation and is also known as the functional language. It is a simplified program development, so it's kind of a lot more of what we see now. Um, 
and it runs on almost any type of computer with a uh, computer with any operating system. Um, but then again, we do have to keep in mind since it's not machine, um, a machine language, we need to convert it to one. And there are co two conversions that uh, you got to keep in mind for the compiler, and that's going to be the compiler and the interpreter. So the compiler is just a separate program that converts the entire source program into a machine language. So it's kind of just compressing all those files um, so that um, it can be read by the machine language in that binary kind of off on. And then lastly, the interpreter um, translates and executes one statement at a time. So that's going to be um, one single thing at a time to um, get all the information needed so that the computer can run properly. Hello class, my name is Kyle O'Donnell. In a moment I'm going to go over the benefits of object-oriented programming as well as application development tools, but before I get into that, I wanted to give you guys a brief definition of what both those terms mean. OOP language, also known as object-oriented programming language, is a program language used to implement objects in a program. An application development tool is software that provides a user-friendly environment for building programs and apps. So with application development tools, that's going to make the developer have an easier time building their program. All right, now we're going to get to some of the benefits of OOP language and application development tools. Both offer the ability to reuse and modify existing objects in different programs. Uh, they become more stable over time. So the more you use it, the better and more stable it's going to be. Uh, developers can create applications faster because they don't have to keep rebuilding the same objects. They can just use them over and over again. Uh, some examples of object-oriented or programming and application development tools. Java is a big, big one. That's going on right now. C++ or anything in the C programming language realm and also Microsoft's Visual Studio which is actually a, uh, a suite. Some other programming languages and app development tools. 4GL also known as fourth generation language. It's a non-procedural language with which programmers write. English-like instructions to communicate with the database. SQL is a common example that you saw in uh, Microsoft Access. An application generator is a program that creates source code from a specification of a required functionality, and it typically consists of a report writer, forms, and a menu generator. A macro is a series of statements that instructs programs or app of how to complete a task. It enables users to automate difficult, routine, or repetitive tasks in application software or database programs. It's commonly found in Microsoft Excel. All right, how to create a macro. There's two different ways of going about that. You could either record a macro or you could uh, write a macro. Uh, when recording, you're going to need to use a macro recorder and press record perform the steps you want the macro to run and then you press done and it will work that way also you could just write the macro into programming language all right now we're going to talk about developing web pages and i'm going to go over the four main ones starting off with html also known as hypertext markup language it's a language used to format documents to display on the web. It's commonly used in a text editor known as Notepad. And uh, the users view the web page in various different web browsers. Next one's going to be XML, uh, in also known as Extensible Markup Language. In XML, the web developers create tags that describe how information is displayed. And it separates content to format to allow browser to display content in an appropriate manner. So this is uh, commonly found in mobile browsing, stuff like that. Uh, 
and it's shown differently than you'd see on a desktop computer. Wireless markup language, uh, it's a subset of XML, is used by developers to design web pages solely for microbrowsing in different mobile friendly browsers. We're going to talk about scripts and ActiveX controls. These are short programs run by browsers to add interactivity to the web page. These small programs run inside of other existing programs. Features include animated graphics, scrolling messages, calendars, and the like. Alright, we're going to talk briefly about script languages. Uh, quick definition is that a script language is an interpretive language that is typically easy to use. One certain script language, JavaScript, allows the programmer to act, add dynamic context and interactive elements to the web page. Perl functions as an inter interpretive script language hosting text processing capabilities. Perl is commonly found as a report processor. All right, and last, we're going to talk about Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails is an open source framework for developing object-oriented, database-driven websites. Ruby on Rails makes developers more productive, providing them with an easy-to-use environment and cutting down on time spent in development.